So I'm Rob Larity. I'm the founder of Cognitive Investments. I'm here with Jacob Shapiro, who is Cognitive's Director of Geopolitical Analysis. And the subject of today's meeting is Russia and Ukraine. So before we start, uh, just a brief disclosure. Cognitive has been buying uh, Russian stocks for its clients uh, over the past few weeks. We started buying on January 26th, uh, and we increased our position last Friday when, uh, when the market was selling off. Uh, now, this is not investment advice, it's a disclosure. Uh, Cognitive has a fairly long-term time horizon, and we're going to explain our analysis in the discussion today. Uh, so if you want actual investment advice, please come to us. Uh, nothing here can be construed as such. <clears throat> so with that said, let's get started. Um, Jacob, the world appears to be convinced right now that Russia and Ukraine are going to war. What are people getting wrong? Yeah, and Rob, excuse me if I'm always looking to the side here because there's a lot going on right now and I have some like Twitter feeds and social media feeds up on my left and I'm watching to see if anything's happening while we're talking. Um, we couldn't have picked a better time for this uh, discussion. We, we picked this date randomly last week, thinking that the Russia-Ukraine issue would obviously still be important. And of course it is. But just in the last hour or two, there's been a lot of reports of shelling in Donetsk and Luhansk. These are the two areas of Eastern Ukraine that are primarily Russian speaking dominated. They're pro-Russia. They even want independence from Ukraine. And they're the real um, on the ground manifestation of this conflict. And the concern is that if you're going to see shelling there, that is the sort of um, justification that what that Russia would need in order to undertake some kind of military intervention. Now, as we're going to about to go through, um, I've been sort of saying for weeks, I don't think a large scale military intervention is going to come to pass. Um, this also, I feel like, is where I, I feel like for the first time in my life, um, the studies I've done in philosophy are actually helping me because. What does invasion mean? What does war mean? If, if Russia rolls some tanks into these two disputed regions, does that count as a war? Does that count as an invasion? Does that mean the United States is gonna levy the full range of its sanctions against Russia? Is it just if they go past these two disputed regions? Like we get into a lot of interesting questions. Um, before we get started too, I, I just wanna say it's um, the person who trained me in doing geopolitical analysis um, told me when I started that when Whenever you're doing it, it's actually a very lonely profession because usually the times when you're right are the times where nobody else is saying the things that you're saying. So you have to be able to kind of stand the breach. And even while everybody else around you is saying something else, you have to be able to stand your ground and say, no, I really think this is what's happening and kind of stake your position on that. And I honestly feel like we're in one of those situations because the Western voices right now are all pretty clear that they think an invasion is coming. Um, this week has almost been comical because it feels like every single day is different. First, there were leaks from intelligence agencies that they were going to invade February 16th. When that didn't happen, they moved the date to February 20th. I mean, it's starting to feel almost like a, a fundamentalist religious movement, not an intelligence agency thing. So I feel that loneliness right now. I also see that there's a complete disjuncture between really two groups. The first is between Russian analysts and American analysts. Um, I've had a chance to go to Russia a couple times to speak at the university tied to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs there. I keep in touch with a good number of Russian analysts like me who are doing exactly what I'm doing with you for Russian audiences back in Moscow. Um, I've been talking to them a lot over the past week. They're telling me they don't think an invasion is happening. One, one friend who's, who's a new dean at, at that university told me today he thinks there's a 99% chance that Putin is using the threat of war, not war itself to actually get what he wants. Um, switch to the other side, every single US analyst I know, especially those in Washington, are absolutely certain an invasion is coming. And they've been certain about it for weeks and there is nothing that will dissuade them from the fact that an invasion is coming. Um, there's also, I think, a disjuncture there between reading the tactical situation and reading the strategic situation. So I am a strategic analyst. Um, I'm trying to figure out what Putin is thinking what Russia wants, what it is capable of doing, what it's not capable of doing. Um, obviously capabilities and all those things, it matters what's happening tactically, but it's sort of a second order thing. Tactics is only one part of the picture for me. I think that a lot of the sources that are talking about an imminent invasion 
they're looking at this from a purely tactical point of view. They see 150,000 troops on the border. They see over 100 um, tactical battle groups that are massing on the border with Ukraine. They're drawing pictures on maps of this is where this pincer is going to come in and it's going to meet this pincer and then they're going to surround Kiev and all the all the command and control things are being constructed that would lead towards an invasion. Um, I'm not dismissing the tactical information. You have to integrate that into a broader view. But if you want to kind of sum up what my view here is in one sentence before we go a little bit more in depth to it, it is that strategically, it does not make sense for Russia to invade Ukraine. It makes sense for them to make it seem like they'll invade Ukraine. They have to sell that bluff as hard as they possibly can to get the political concessions that they want. But I don't think that there is a strategic justification for trying to invade Ukraine. And we'll go through the reasons I think that um, in this presentation, but that's, I think, where the disjuncture is. If you're thinking at the strategic level, we haven't reached a yes to that question. If and when we do, or if I'm wrong about some of the things that we present to you here today, that I think is where the decision is gonna be made. And that's where I wouldn't get too caught up with what the latest headline is about this tank group that moved here or this thing that happened there. That's really fodder kind of for the media cycle. Um, a last thing before we kind of get into the formal part of this and to some of the slides that I want to show you. Um, I'm also a geopolitical analyst. So that means I'm trying to strip away all of the noise, all of the personalities. I'm trying to define here in really simple terms, what does Russia want? What can Russia do? What can Russia not do? Um, geopolitics as a discipline is better at thinking about things long-term. The longer your time horizon, the more accurate geopolitics becomes. The shorter your time horizon, the more some of those tactical things that I talked about matter. Um, a great example of this is, let's say that Russia has no intention of invading Ukraine, um, but somebody, some commander on the ground throws a grenade because he's having a bad morning, or somebody is on patrol and there's a friendly fire incident, but they don't realize it's a friendly fire incident. And suddenly you get a whole lot of fighting. That's one of the problems with the fog of war. And when you deploy troops like this, even mistakes can then mushroom into these larger problems. At the strategic level though, that's where we're gonna try and keep it. We're gonna try and talk about Russia's geopolitics and what that tells us about their intentions and sort of divine some insights from that. So uh, let's start with a couple slides. Um, let's look at this first map here which is a map of Russia's population density. Uh, this map is a little bit old. We don't have completely up-to-date information on Russia's population density, but I don't think it's changed that much in the last 15 years, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, the thing that I want to point out on this slide is that basically all of Russia's population lives in Europe. It's all that darker area towards the left side of the map that borders Europe. Russia looks like a very big country. It is the largest country in the world in terms of land area. In most of the country, people don't live there. Um, Siberia is a frozen tundra. It's good for drinking vodka and for you know having thousands of acres to look at over a mass abyss. It is not a place where there are huge population centers and probably won't ever be. Um, Russia likes to think of itself as a Eurasian country, as having interests in Asia and Europe, all these other things. Um, European countries for centuries have been looking down on the Russians, saying that they're uncivilized, saying they're not good enough. This is what Peter the Great and Tchaikovsky and Dostoevsky, all that stuff is about the Russians trying to show that no, actually we belong as part of Western civilization. We are um, as evolved as you are in Europe who look down on us. Uh, and that's because Russia is a European country. Europe won't say that because they wanna think of Russia as this other, Russia won't say that because they sort of you know, have this own syndrome of being underestimated by the Europeans for a long time, but they're part of Europe's security structure. And a lot of the reason for the disagreements that are happening right now is people continue to not think of Russia as part of Europe. So just keep that in mind as we're going forward. Things that happen in Europe matter way more to Russia than anything else. That's the most important thing for Russia in general. Um, our next map is one of my favorite maps. I love these perspective maps. Um, and this is a map of what the world looks like from Russia's point of view. Um, it's inverted, so as if you're sort of looking down on Russia from Moscow, roughly, or from the center of Russia's position. Um, there's a couple things I want you to take away from this map. Uh, the first is that Russia in general, you, and they're, they're, low, they're labeled there on the map, there's three general natural boundaries, for lack of a better term, for, for Russia's position. You've got the Carpathian Mountains in Europe, you've got the Caucasus Mountains, 
um, in the Caucasus going down into the Middle East. And then you've got um, kind of the steppes that go into these mountain ranges that separate China from Russia. This is Russia's sphere of influence and it's huge, it's massive. And it's also relatively contained until you get to Europe. The Caucasus mountains clearly cut Russia off from the Middle East. If the Caucasus mountains wouldn't, weren't there, Russia would be a major Middle East power, but those mountains serve as a barrier. If you didn't have these mountains around the steppes in Asia, Russia and China might actually have a much more interesting relationship than I think they currently do. The main weakness for Russia, unfortunately for Russia, is in Europe, because while you do have the, Carpath the Carpathian Mountains there, there's also an open kind of lane there that the Carpathian Mountains don't, um, don't block. So let's go to the next map here, and we'll see that a little bit more in depth. Um, this is the Northern European Plain. I always joke that this is the invasion superhighway of Europe. Um, for in the lifetime of everybody who's on this call, all of the countries that are on the west of the Northern European plain, from France to Germany, Poland, you name it, they have always feared that Russia was going to invade them, that Russian power was going to expand out of Moscow and into the rest of Europe. Um, that's a historical aberration. For the most part, it sucks to be Russia and has always sucked to be Russia historically. And the reason is because of that Northern European plain. You can drive cavalry or tanks or whatever the heck you want pretty easily across that Northern European plain and you won't meet any natural boundaries until you get to the Ural Mountains like deep in Russia before you're getting to Siberia. If you think I'm exaggerating, um, consider that in the 20th century, Nazi, Nazi Germany rolled their tanks all the way to Moscow and almost conquered Russia. In the 19th century, Napoleon went all the way to Moscow, burned the city, occupied it for a while before he had to go home because the Russian winter defeated him. This is my favorite. I was looking for one in every century. In the 18th century, the Swedes invaded Russia and got almost all the way to Moscow. In the 17th century, it was the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth and they got all the way to Moscow and they burned the city. So if you're thinking as a Russian strategic decision maker in literally every century for the past half millennium, a foreign power has come across the Northern European plain, gotten all the way to Moscow and burned your capital city. For longer than the United States has been a country, this is something that Russian strategic decision makers have had to think about. So yes, Russia is somewhat paranoid. And yes, some of the demands and security things that Russia says are crazy and they're designed for diplomatic purposes or negotiating purposes, whatever have you. But when you look at this map, you also have to understand the paranoia is somewhat earned. They've experienced over and over and over again what insecurity on the Northern European plain looks like. And any Russian leader, whether it's Vlad the Impaler or Peter the Great or Vladimir Putin or any of the Soviet leaders, they're always thinking about how to make Russia more secure. And that I think really goes down to trying to think about what Russia wants. At the simplest level, what Russia wants is to decrease that weakness on the Northern European plain. And the best way, or at least the first way to do that is to extend to the Carpathian Mountains. Because once you get to the Carpathian Mountains, you haven't neutralized the threat, but you're dealing with a much less wide, a much narrower lane that foreign powers can actually use to strike at Moscow. And this is the other unfortunate thing about Russian geopolitics. There's no natural endpoint. So the only way that Russia knows how to get security is to push further and further and further out, which is why even Russia's weakness and its defensiveness manifests as aggressiveness. It will always keep pushing. Um, the Soviet Union did this. It conquered some of these areas, right? Some of these areas were part of the Soviet Union. Then it had satellite states that it basically dominated itself and rolled in Russia, uh, Soviet tanks whenever it needed to. And then it also sponsored communist parties throughout Western Europe as part of a campaign to build political influence and hopefully extend their reach all the way across the Northern European plain. In general, what Russia is trying to do with its security is it's trying to neutralize this threat that's on the map. Now, the question is, what can Russia do? If Russia could invade Ukraine and conquer Ukraine and not face cataclysmic problems, it probably would. That would be the safest thing for it to do. But I don't think Russia can do that. Ukraine is the largest country in Western Europe by size. It's bigger than France. It also has a population of 44 million people. Eastern Ukraine, you've got a lot of Russian speakers, a lot of folks who 
like Russia and feel culturally attuned towards Russia, but that's changed in the West. Um, there is a healthy Ukrainian national identity in the West. They don't want to be part of Russia. They want to be part of the West. They're looking towards Western Europe. They're looking towards the EU. They're looking towards NATO. So what that means in practical terms is you've got tens of millions of people who would be extremely hostile to a Russian takeover. The Russian military is strong. It, it's not that strong. It can't possibly conquer a country the size of France, subdue a population of 40 million people, and maintain its economy. Like those are things that I think are just impossible for Russia to do. So as we talk here, you should know that I have a couple assumptions about Russia's capabilities and what its constraints are. The first are is that Russia can't win by fighting. What Russia wants is to have some sense of security and political influence in Eastern Europe that allows it to push the Carpathians. I don't think it can win by force of arms. All that it's trying to do here is make sure that it has that political influence so that it can protect itself from that point of view. My second assumption is that Ukraine is going to resist. That even, let's say I'm wrong, let's say Russia rolls in with the tanks and envelops Kiev and all these guys and intelligence agencies, let's say they're all right. Um, I think Ukraine will resist. Ukraine has a formidable, formidable military of their own, even if the Ukrainian military failed, I'd expect a long-term insurgency in most of Western Ukraine against Russia that would eventually end in Russia going home in ignominious defeat. So I'm assuming Russia doesn't have the military force to conquer Ukraine. I'm assuming that Ukraine will resist. And here's the third thing I'm assuming. I'm assuming that if Russia did this, if Russia really went for an invasion, the sanctions from the United States and NATO countries and a lot of the Western European states would be real. Most of the sanctions we've seen since 2014, when this whole Ukraine issue initially started, they've been nice, but they've been symbolic. They've been targeted at individuals. Um, yes, they've hurt Russia in some ways, and they're an annoyance, but they have not gone after the Russian economy in a real way. I would assume that if Russia went hard after Ukraine, that Washington and Berlin and Paris are not just bluffing, that they're actually prepared to enforce real sanctions and real economic pain against Russia. If they're all weaning and if they're all just talking a big game and they're not willing to follow through on those sanction threats, then I'm also wrong. So keep in mind, so th those are my three biggest assumptions. Um, I, I don't even wanna call them assumptions because they're based on a lot of analysis and a lot of gathering of information. But if you break any one of those assumptions, my view might be wrong. And maybe there'll be questions about those assumptions as we go forward. Um, this kind of brings us to the Russian economy. And this is what our next few slides are about. Um, Russia is really a commodity-driven economy. Um, it is not just an oil economy anymore, um, but most of the Russian economy is about exporting things like oil, natural gas, wheat, uh, nickel. We'll kind of go through all of them. This first kind of map here, though, just shows you the importing markets for all Russian products, period. It's a little deceiving because the, the mark in yellow shows you that China is actually the largest importer of Russian goods at about 14 or 15 percent. China is probably not going to do anything to Russia if, if things happen in Ukraine. But look at all the light blue and even the light green in Europe and even the United States. If you add all that up, uh, 41 percent of Russia's exports go to NATO countries or EU member states. If you throw in Japan and South Korea, which are part of the US Security Alliance, you get to 48%. So if Russia is really going to invade Ukraine and it's really going to risk systemic sanctions to its economy, it is talking about cutting itself off from roughly 40 to 50% of the countries that import its goods full stop. I don't care how brilliant Putin is. I don't care how much reserves Russia has been able to save in the last eight years. I don't care how high the price of oil goes. If you're any country and you lose basically half of your export market overnight, that's an economic catastrophe. There's no way that you can actually survive that, especially when you're, you're based on commodities, especially when you're talking about things that other people consume. These are not things that can be repurposed or for which there demand in Russia to have. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think we're going to dive in a little bit deeper into, uh, yes, this is a slide about Russian and Ukrainian wheat. Um, Russia and Ukraine together are, are one of the largest exporters of wheat in the world. I like this chart just because it shows you um, we're not just talking about the developed world here. We're not just talking about Russia and the Western European countries. Um, if, you, if you had this kind of large-scale military conflict, you're talking about countries like Egypt 
African countries like Nigeria, all of which are um, dependent on importing Russian wheat and Russian grains. So not only are you destabilizing all of Western Europe, you're also potentially just um, you're also potentially destabilizing huge parts of the Middle East, huge parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. If you go down this road, which it's not good for basically any power here, certainly not the exporting one, certainly not for the Western European ones. Um, the next slide, I believe, is going to be this is this is oil. Again, this just shows you the extent to which Europe is dependent on importing Russian oil. Um, the next slide after this is for natural gas. The natural gas picture is a lot worse. Um, Europe gets about a quarter of its oil from Russia. It gets almost half of its natural gas from Russia. One of the things that's been happening in the last few weeks is that the US has been saying that it's going to be able to help Europe meet its energy demand if the worst happened with Ukraine and they were cut off from supplies of Russian natural gas. There's not enough natural gas in the world for Europe to make up that 50% dependency. Maybe if you're being optimistic, the US with some of its allies and rerouting LNG and you know doing everything you possibly could, maybe you could make up 15% of that. But I don't see how you can make up much more. Now, that's not just a dependency for Europe. It's also a dependency for Russia. Because again, yes, Europe depends on Russia for natural gas. Russia depends on Europe buying its natural gas as well. So if Russia can't pipe this natural gas anywhere, and it hasn't built the pipelines yet to allow it to pipe it to China, they're doing that now, maybe a couple of years they'll be, they'll be able to do it, can't do it now, then Russia's basically just saying, okay, so we're just gonna leave all of that money on the table. Um, I don't think that that's possible, and I think that's gonna be part of the decision-making calculus in Moscow. I don't think Putin is afraid of sanctions very much, but he's certainly afraid of tanking the entire Russian economy um, just for some adventurism in Ukraine that's not going to get him what he actually wants, which is political control at the Carpathian Mountains. Um, our next slide is probably going to dive into, um, what is this one? Ah, fertilizers. Uh, we already talked about wheat. This is a map that shows you what the global export market for fertilizers looks like. You see there's basically five big ones. Uh, there's Russia, China, Morocco, the United States, and Canada. Belarus is also a big one as well. Um, folks who have been following CI for a while, you know about the fertilizer story because we've been writing about it for a while, um, but this market is extremely tight this year. Uh, we're already talking about inflation. One of the primary causes of inflation right now is food inflation. One of the reasons there's food inflation is because fertilizer, fertilizer prices are way up. If you have a real Russia-Ukraine conflict, fertilizer prices are going to go up even more. Russia is the largest single exporter of especially nitrogen-based fertilizers in the world, something like 12 to 13 percent of the market. I'm trying to paint a picture here of mutually assured destruction. If this happens, it's not just Russia that's going to take it bad. It's not just Ukraine that's going to take it bad. Some of those people, of course, in Ukraine will take it the worst, but the entire global economy is going to suffer. It's going to suffer in major ways, which is why one of the reasons I think we're going to see some resolution. Uh, your next slide is going to drive this point home. Um, this, is, um, th this is exports of nickel, which again, Russia is the largest exporter of nickel in the world. Uh, that matters for you because if you want your new stainless steel dishwasher, probably going to need nickel. Uh, if you want your shiny new Tesla with its nice battery that you can show off to your friends, you're going to need nickel. There's a reason Elon Musk is literally running around the world trying to find new sources of nickel because he doesn't even have enough now with the global economy working the way that it's supposed to. Um, so in general, when you're thinking about the Russian economy, um, it is dependent on people buying these things from it. And if you invade Ukraine, if you really go beyond the pale here and trigger the types of sanctions that the US and Germany have threatened in case there's a major invasion, you're talking about the Russian economy really collapsing. Um, Russia has done a lot to improve its economic sovereignty, but Putin came out just this morning and was saying, we haven't done enough. Um, that's enough of the slides. I kind of want to take it back. And before we open it up for questions, which I think is probably what most people are here for, to kind of ask their questions and have a dialogue about what's going on back and forth. Um, I also just want to share a couple kind of parting thoughts. Um, the first is that um, one of the things that Russia has been saying, and I think that this is right, is that we've gotten a little bit too used to just things continuing on peacefully as they are. Um, I don't think, if, if I'm right about where the situation is going, I don't think we're going to get a situation where in two weeks Russia decides to take its ball and go home and everything goes back to normal. 
Russia wants serious political, economic, even security concessions. It wants to be taken seriously. And part of the reason it's doing what it's doing is because it doesn't feel like it's been taken seriously in the past. All of which is to say, you probably are hoping that this is gonna go away from the headlines in the next week or two, one way or another. I don't think it will. I think the Russians are there to stay. It is a lot cheaper for them to keep 100,000 troops at, Russia, uh, at the Ukraine border than it is for them to keep going back and forth. Um, it's also a lot cheaper for them to do that and have that menacing kind of intimidating posture than it is for them to actually invade. Um, a really good example of what I'm talking about here um, is what China did with rare earth elements back in the early 2010s. Um, for those of you who don't know, China was the dominant source of rare earth elements for most of the world and especially for Japan uh, in the early 2010s. Uh, China decided that they wanted to use that leverage because people were upsetting them in their backyard and said, we're going to restrict rare earth exports. What did that do? It just triggered everybody around the world investing in their own rare earth refineries and mining capacities and things like that. And yes, China is still the dominant provider of rare earths. It won't be here in the next couple of years as some of these investments pay off. The point I'm trying to make is the threat of invasion for Putin is way more powerful than actual invasion. If he can hold this over Ukraine's head and over Europe's head and over US and over the United States' head, he can bring them to the table for negotiation. And that's what he wants. He wants people to take him seriously and he wants concessions at the negotiating table. The second thing is that with all this noise about their shelling in Donetsk and there's 150,000 troops on the border, all these other things, um, nobody's actually listening to what the Russians are saying. So the Russians put out a formal response to the US yesterday. They put it in writing, they published it in all the major Russian newspapers. They said, a, they said three things to keep in mind. Number one, they gave a list of demands. They were crazy demands. I think they were the beginning of, of a negotiating position, but they were demands. So obviously they haven't shut down conversation yet. They wanna talk about their demands. They're not putting their demands out there just to then invade kind of the next day. Um, the second thing that they put in that document was they said that because the United States and Europe has ignored them thus far, they will have to engage in a quote unquote military technical response. Um, this goes back to that philosophical question we opened up with. What does war mean? What does invasion mean? What does military technical response mean? Nobody has any clue. I doubt they even know exactly what military technical response means. The important thing though, is that the sentence after that one, and this is the third thing to keep in mind about what's in that document, is that there will be no war. That Russia will has not invaded Ukraine and does not plan to invade Ukraine anytime soon. They could be lying. Um, Russian analysts could be feeding somebody like me that line to kind of create a false sense of surprise. I think it's more likely though that, that what's happening is that Russia is actually feeding all of this information about how tough they are and how intimidating they look at the border so that the media and these other US analysts I talk about tell you about how Russia's invasion is coming and that that puts political pressure on Western political leaders to make some of the concessions that we're talking about here. The second thing that got completely lost today and all the shelling with Donetsk and Luhansk and the, the troop movements is that the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said that he wants to have talks with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken next week, and that they're just trying to find a date and a time to do so. And Blinken confirmed that. He said that they're in discussions with the Russians to set those meetings. They said it won't be in Geneva, but it'll be somewhere else. And if the Russians invade, they won't have the talks themselves. I think that's important, again, because strip away all the noise, strip away all the media reports. You've got Russia saying, we don't want war. We don't have plans to invade. We have a list of demands and we wanna have security talks with the top level officials in the United States next week. So either it's the most brilliant bluff in the history of bluffs, or they're not there yet. What they wanna do is they wanna sit down, having turned up the temperature, having scared everyone, having, having bared their teeth and showed everyone how serious they are and say, okay, are you interested in discussing our demands now? And can we talk about some of these things that we're interested in seeing movement on? That's where I'm really seeing things going. Um, I also, you know, when you're thinking about geopolitics, um, things can feel kind of abstract, um, almost completely detached. And I do just want to say that um, this is not a detached situation for the people in Donetsk and in Luhansk and in Eastern Ukraine. For them, this is all super scary. 
and I'm sure for Russians as well, especially Russian soldiers who are not exactly sure what their orders are. They're freezing in the middle of the winter. There is a human component to all this that we should all keep in mind that I think gets lost um, in the reporting on this. Um, it goes back to that old F. Scott Fitzgerald quote, the, the key to intelligence is being able to keep multiple ideas in your mind at the same time. Um, and that's really my key message here. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, I am pretty sure, or at least I have a fairly high confidence rating that I, I don't think that Russia is about to invade Ukraine and that this is all about trying to secure political concessions from the Russian point of view. I've also laid out my assumptions to you about what I might have gotten wrong. And if we push on any of those, I'm completely willing to admit that I'm not infallible and that things might not go the direction that I'm seeing and that Ukraine is a national security interest for Russia. If Russia really does feel threatened, if there are things happening in Ukraine that we're not privy to, that Russia views as a direct threat, it will respond. Um, it has to respond. This is, this is a matter of the utmost importance for Russia. It's also why Russia in the long term is probably going to win out here, because this is more important to Russia than just about anybody else. Um, so that I'll, I'll sort of stop there and kind of open it up for questions. Or Rob, you might want to moderate a question or two, um, kind of take it from there. Yeah, so if you look at the bottom of your screen, there you should see a button uh, where you can click and input your questions. So please feel free to do that now. Uh, just to start us off, though, I'd like to ask a question, Jacob. So you have spoken in the past about geopolitics being sort of this uh, uh, push and pull between personalities and constraints. And you just described the constraints you know, at work in this situation. You didn't really talk about Putin as an individual. Uh, can you share any thoughts that you might have on Putin himself and what he's done in the past, maybe you know, with comparisons to the situation in Georgia or the 2015 situation in Ukraine? Um, does that shed any light into what's going to happen here, given those constraints that you've described? It's a tricky question, um, and I'm I don't feel 100% qualified to psychoanalyze um, Putin. One of the reasons I like geopolitics so much is, is that because it deals with things that you can actually examine and measure. Um, whereas really, and this is kind of the point I was talking about, the shorter your time horizon, the more intelligence matters. So the more it matters that you can speak to Putin and see exactly what's going on in his mind. All that said, <clears throat> there are some things we know about Putin in regards to Ukraine. First of all, and maybe we can send out a link afterwards with the, with the video recording of this to this essay. Um, Putin, or somebody tied to Putin, uh, wrote a very, very long essay a couple of years ago about Russia's historical relationship with Ukraine. And a lot of folks who are anti-Russia, I don't think have read that essay super closely, but that essay basically talks about Putin's view of Ukraine both as a part of Russia generally, but also about Putin's respect for Ukraine as a people and in terms of its independence. He talks there about how there are forces within Ukraine that are using Ukraine um, in a way that would threaten Russia and that those people are his enemies. And if those people threaten Russia, that is what Russia will respond to. Um, I, I, I raise that to say that, and I, I fully am aware that that is at least half propaganda, but no good propaganda is, is is effective unless it's at least half true. So I think there are some half truths in there that are really important to think about. And the most important one is that I don't think that Putin wants to conquer Ukraine and he hasn't said he wants to conquer Ukraine. What he does wanna make sure is that Ukraine does not become a launching post for Western attacks against Russia. I think that is his primary interest there going forward. And if he thinks that sort of thing is happening, he's gonna move forward. The second thing we know about Putin is that he has said many times over the past couple of years that he thinks that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the worst geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, which is kind of a big thing to say considering how many geopolitical catastrophes there were in the 20th century. It wasn't an uneventful time period. Um, but the reason he thinks that again goes back to some of those maps that we talked about, because if you look at it from Russia's perspective, the 20th century began with revolution and really Russia having a civil war that almost brought it to its knees. Um, and then Russia was able to become stronger than it's ever been in its history. Um, the rise of the Soviet Union, you finally had Russia pushing out in all directions so that it actually had a fairly secure national security. And the reason that the Soviet Union fell apart was because the government did a really bad job of managing things. 
Um, they didn't invest in the economy the way that they were supposed to. Um, they got caught in their own versions of the Vietnam War. Theirs was in Afghanistan, spending military resources that they didn't have that over time sapped the economy even more until the whole apparatus kind of fell down on top of itself. And for a period of about a decade, Russia was really just in chaos. And Putin was the one who came in and cleaned up afterward and tried to put the pieces back together. Um, some of these, some of my Russian analyst friends that I talked to, um, you, know, you go out drinking with them or you go out to dinner with them. And I've even had a chance to ask them, hey, like you like this Putin guy? Like, is this the person you want leading your country? I don't know that I would want that person leading my country. And they're remarkably sober about it and almost sarcastic about it. They'll say, well, no, of course not. We don't love this guy, but we saw what happened when he wasn't around. We saw the chaos that was going on. Our government, our state, our geography doesn't work the way that yours does. And the thing that Putin is really good about is about maintaining a sense of stability, maintaining a sense of calm, maintaining a, a sense of security. So that's a very long winded way of saying that I do think that Putin sees it as his historical mission to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. He wants to leave Russia better than he found it. And that means some modicum of political stability at home and a much better geopolitical situation from a national security perspective. And you, solving the Ukraine issue one way or another, whether that's military force or a political deal or something else, that is something that he wants to do before he turns over to a new generation of Russian leaders. Um, I think he knows, though, that Russia is not the power that it once was, that demographically in a lot of different ways, it is not as powerful as it was when it was the Soviet Union. And what he can do, the best things that he can do are use his position to, to solidify that political influence in the places that are most important. So I have no doubt that Ukraine is an extremely important issue for Putin and that he sees it probably as part of his legacy. I do, however, and maybe this is my own bias, I don't think Putin is crazy. I don't think he's evil. I don't think he's going to drive his country into ruin just to say that he marched some tanks to Kiev. I think he is thinking strategically and pragmatically, and he's going to do whatever he needs to keep Ukraine within Russia's sphere of influence. And I don't think he's gotten to the point yet, based on everything that he's said and everything that he's doing, that he thinks he has to invade to accomplish that. Now, if all this doesn't work, if we're having the same conversation a year from now or two years from now, it might be a different story. But the move he's making right now, I don't think it's a military one. I think this is about military intimidation for political benefit. I don't think we're at the point yet where he's thinking about invasion. OK, so we've got a few questions queued up here. Cool. Um, generally, there, there's investment questions and there are political questions. So we'll start with the political, and then we can segue into the investment afterwards. So first, uh, one question. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, what are your thoughts on the willingness of the Biden administration to negotiate in bad faith and or instigate some sort of conflict to distract from the inflation problem at home? Um, just trying to get a handle on how the US is looking to either escalate or de-escalate here in good faith. This is a good question. Um, I think this has to play a role in some of it. Um, the Biden administration has not had the easiest first year in office, both from a domestic policy point of view and from a foreign policy point of view. It didn't get all the stimulus that it wanted. It hasn't been able to get Manchin and Cinema to play ball on a lot of the domestic issues that Biden was talking about. Um, I don't think he's been sort of the transformative leader that he, he wants to be. Um, Afghanistan also blew up in his face. And in some ways you can kind of pinpoint the decline in Biden's popularity figures to really what was an intelligence failure in Afghanistan, where he was getting information that you know, if he talked to me, I would have told him was nonsense, even though I'm not following Afghanistan closely. The idea that the US was gonna withdraw and everything was gonna be fine was kind of laughable. Um, so I don't think that the United States is negotiating in bad faith at all. Um, I, I do think, however, that the Biden administration is welcoming a chance to show Biden as strong as somebody who's going to resist Russia and as somebody who is decisive at the level of foreign policy, because that has been an image of Biden that has, that has kind of gone away. I will also say, and this is something that um, Russian analysts talk to, that I talk to bemoan a lot, and I also bemoan it because it, it, it has not been good from a global st stability standpoint. Um, Russia has infected itself into US domestic politics in a way that is really unhelpful. 
And part of that is Russia's fault for interfering in elections in 2016 and the things they did around that. And part of that is this US obsession with trying to use Russia to say that one election result is legitimate, one is not legitimate. Really since 2016, um, US foreign policy has not been about Russia. It's been about both parties figuring out how to use Russia in their constellation of policy priorities in general. Um, so I do think there's an aspect of kind of political showmanship here. And I do think that Biden is playing this up in part because it makes him look good. All that said, um, Biden was unique in the sense that he's the first president going back to Clinton who came into power, not promising to have better relations with Russia. So whether it was Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, they all promised better relations with Russia. They wanted to turn the page on the Cold War and things were gonna be better. Biden did not promise that. Biden, uh, Biden called Putin a thug. He said he was a threat to democracy. He described them as a peer threat to United States geopolitical power. I know for a fact that the Russians think that might mean Biden's a good person to negotiate with. Um, the best historical analog for this is Richard Nixon in China because Nixon hated China and hated communists more than anyone. And he was the one who gave up Taiwan and he was the one who normalized US relations with China. So to a certain extent, Biden's credentials on Russia are great. He's been tough from day one and he continued to be tough to look good. Um, and it might be really good for Biden to also be the guy that can say, hey, I looked tough and I got concessions out of Putin too. Um, so I think for both Putin and Biden, there's actually a dance that's happening here where both can get what they want out of the situation, not just at the geopolitical level, but also at the domestic political level, but you know, with the proviso that we're starting to get outside the bounds of what I'm an, ex an expert at and starting to get into in sort of armchair domestic political analysis. But that's the best answer I can, I can give you for that one. Next question. Um, it seems like the West, particularly Germany and Italy, are particularly, uh, excuse me, reluctant to threaten real punishing sanctions on Russia, especially when it, become, when it comes to energy. Do you think that the West has credibly threatened mutually assured destruction type sanctions? Uh, you would also be reluctant to threaten real punishing sanctions if you got 50% of your natural gas from Russia. If uh, heating if heating our houses here in the winter in the United States was dependent on importing Russian natural gas, I'm sure we'd be taking a much different tack. Um, I also, I, I, the, the questioner didn't ask this, but I see this media narrative out there a lot, which is that the, the Germans are weak, that they're not willing to confront the Russians enough, that the Italians are weak, they're not willing to support the US. Um, in general, European geopolitics is better when Germany is weak. I don't really wanna read stories about German tanks and Teutonic Knights marching through the forests and the, the reinvigoration of the German military machine. We saw that movie and I'm not really interested in going back there. Um, but the answer to your question is yes. I think that the European and NATO countries have committed themselves to crippling economic sanctions if Russia undertakes a full scale invasion. I don't think that you know, um, piddling around in Donetsk and Luhansk is gonna be enough to turn Germany. I think there might be some arm wringing in Germany and they've got a very divided government itself. For Germany, I think it's gonna to have to be an unambiguous full-scale invasion of Ukraine for those sorts of sanctions to come through. But if Russia does that, yes, even Germany, which has been very, very, you're right, very reluctant, very hesitant on economic sanctions has said, if you invade, like Nord Stream 2 is over, sanctions are for real, like this doesn't work for the European security approach. So I, I think that mutually assured destruction threat is real and that if Putin is thinking that it's not real, he's miscalculating. That is, by the way, something that could be happening. Uh, Putin is used to the Europeans kind of rolling over and not doing anything. He may be thinking, ah, they're gonna do what they do all the time, threaten, but not actually do anything. I do think that if Russia invaded for real, if we had tank columns going towards Kiev, absolutely there would be crippling sanctions. I think they'll follow through on this threat. Okay, we have two uh, closely related questions that we'll ask together. So the first one is, uh, what effect do you think the events that have already taken place are likely to have on the EU itself, both politically and economically, uh, particularly Germany and the Netherlands? And a uh, related question, if indeed you have Russian destabilization coming out of this, there's some series of events where uh, volatility spikes, uh, uh, the Russian state and economy becomes destabilized what is the effect of that on Europe in particular? The first question is that, and this is actually a long-term view we've had at CI for a while, 
um, which is that we expect the European Union to grow stronger over time. And that's not because we think the forces, the internal forces that have been pulling the European Union apart are any less. It's just because the external forces that Europe are facing are more powerful than them. Um, there's a reason that the French President Emmanuel Macron has been running around doing shuttle diplomacy, talking about how Europe needs to have its own approach to security, one separate from NATO and the United States. Um, Germany has also been doing the same thing. I hope that for the Europeans, this makes it clear that they don't, they can't just sit on the sidelines anymore. Um, the United States has more important interests in the Pacific. Russia is not an existential issue for the United States anymore. So if Europe wants to deal with, with Russia on geopolitical terms, none of the individual European countries are strong enough on their own. They're going to have to pool their power and they're gonna to have to be able to act as a more geopolitical actor against Russia going forward. Um, that's not something you're gonna see in the immediate term, but I absolutely think the memory of this crisis is going to affect Europe for a generation ahead. And you'll see that at the political level in terms of strengthening EU institutions, you might see real move towards a European defense force. I think you'll also see more investment into green energy technologies that make sure that these European countries are not so dependent on imports of Russian commodities going forward. Those are all things that I expect to come out of this in the long term. In the short term, not a whole heck of a lot. I will say though, um, and I, I don't think Macron has looked very good, or at least he, he hasn't secured many concessions from Russia. Um, but in December, his poll numbers didn't look good going into national elections in a month or two. Um, and since he's been running around doing his shuttle diplomacy, he's actually back up around 60%. And suddenly all these challengers in, in France that were coming nipping at his heels aren't there anymore. I think part of that is because people are looking at Macron as this leader, and he's actually positioning France as a leader of this kind of stronger, more unified Europe. So there's at least a short-term uh, measurable political effect that I think we can see out of what's been going on. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't answer the Russian destabilization question. Um, yes, I mean, like again, and this is one of the reasons I have a very hard time imagining scenarios where Russia actually invades, because um, if you just get tit for tat sanctions, if you just get expelling each other's diplomats or going after some of Putin's cronies, it's not going to have a, any kind of real impact on the Russian economy. But if you start going after, uh, you know, the ability of Russia to make payments in dollars by attacking the SWIFT system, or if you go after uh, Russian oil and energy exports, which are really what the Russian budget providing social services in Russia go after, um, there's only so long Russia can keep that up. Um, they have been able to double their reserves. Maybe they could last for a couple months and keep things stable for a while, um, but that's not going to work in the long term. And while I do think there is an audio, a domestic audience in Russia for keeping things stable, remember what I said about that answer about when I asked the Russian analysts, like, do they like Putin? They like Putin because he maintains stability. They like Putin because he knows how to keep the thing together. If he goes too far, and Russia can't export its oil anymore, and they're facing oil sanctions like the one that say or the ones that Iran is facing right now. Um, yeah, I, I don't imagine how Putin could survive that because um, I think that he would probably be gotten rid of and somebody else would go in and try and restore some kind of stability. So that's a very, very low scenario, kind of crazy out there thing, but it's also uh, it tells you one of the reasons why I think this is such a low probability thing in terms of invasion. Next question. Uh, do you think that one of Putin's objectives at this point is to force the US to back down on its sanctions? If so, is that even a realistic possibility? Does he need this concession to win favor internally and as a justification for backing down? And I can, I'll say hi, Betsy. Um, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll quote for you what, um, I believe it was Russia's ambassador to Sweden, I think said this this week. I can't remember if it was, it was Sweden or one of the Nordic states, I forget which one. And basically somebody asked him a very similar question to this. And word for word, um, his, his quote on this was, we don't give a shit about sanctions. Um, so whether you believe him or not, I don't know. I do think that the current sanctions um, that Russia really, I think that ambassador is actually telling you exactly what Russia thinks. They don't really care that much. If anything, Putin likes the current sanctions because it's made things that would have been very difficult for him at a domestic political level much easier. What do I mean by that? Um, even 10 or 15 years ago, the Russian economy was basically Saudi Arabia in Siberia. It was basically just oil and absolutely nothing else. 
some of these sanctions, these sort of half and half sanctions that the US and the rest of the West has imposed on Russia in the last couple of years has allowed Putin to do things that if the sanctions weren't in place might have engendered a lot of domestic and economic backlash. But instead, because those sanctions were on, he was able to say, no, like you're gonna pay more taxes or you're going to invest more in this particular thing because we need economic self-sovereignty and because the evil Westerners are coming in trying to attack mother Russia and Russia's national interests. Um, so kind of counterintuitively, there's a certain level of sanctions that are actually good for Russia because Putin, I think, long term will be judged less by what he does in places like Ukraine and more for what he does to the Russian economy and how strong he leaves the Russian economy. And there's a sweet spot of sanctions that actually help him develop the Russian economy in a way that it hasn't been able to develop before. Now, if you get beyond the sort of sweet spot, and like I said, you start killing the, the cash cows of the Russian economy, we're kind of in a very different situation. But that hasn't been the level of sanctions that have happened yet. It's all been slaps on the wrist. Um, so the current sanctions, I don't think Putin cares much about. He even came out and said today, um, this morning, in a press conference that he did with Lukashenko, the crazy Belarus dictator, that, you know, it doesn't matter what we do in Ukraine, they're probably going to impose more sanctions on us anyway. The thing that Putin can't have is systemic sanctions against Russia's energy exports. It can't have um, sanctions that completely cut Russia off from the dollar quite yet. They're not quite ready to bite that off, I don't think. Um, but the current sanctions, no, I, they'll deal with that just fine. They'll swallow it like a tall glass of water. Next question. If you had to quantify your low probability prediction of a Russian invasion of the Ukraine, uh, what would that probability be? And then separately, uh, where would you put the probability of just an annexation of the separatist controlled districts in the East? So uh, when all this started, I put it at 70, 30, 70% uh, that there wouldn't be a large scale invasion, 30% that there would be some kind of large scale invasion. Um, ironically, over the past three weeks and we have to be a little careful here because I'm just not sure if I'm not sure if I've fallen in love with my own idea, which is always um, a threat when you're an intelligence analyst. Once you see the pattern, it's really hard to unsee the pattern. But if anything, what's happened in the last few weeks has increased my confidence. I'd put it at 80-20 right now. Um, the Luhansk stuff and the Donetsk stuff today was the first time in the last three weeks that I've even blinked or felt any kind of um, lack of confidence in my position at all. Uh, but I'm still at that 70 to 80% no invasion rate. I will say, by the way, that's about as high as I get. So I'm not one of, I'm not the type of analyst who comes out with prognostications that are 100% positive. I'm almost never 100% positive about anything. So if I tell you I'm 75% sure, that's just about as sure as I possibly get. It's also um, one of these situations where, okay, I'm 75% sure, but the 25 or 30% of the other is a really, really bad outcome. Um, so I think it is worth it to sort of say a 30% likelihood of invasion, even if that is a low figure, when you look at the potential impacts of that though, it's huge. And, and that I think also qualifies the extent to which I, you know, when I say 70, 30, that might sound impressive, but 30% for that sort of cataclysmic thing is actually kind of larger than, than you would be comfortable with. I'm, I'm trying to have my cake there and eat it too. And I bet Rob will call me out on that in a second, but that's the first. On Luhansk and Donetsk, um, that's a harder one. And I'm not sure that, that, that Richter scale has been moving a lot more for me in the past kind of weeks. And today's events have obviously made me think about it more. Um, I think that what Russia wants is not to do that. And I say that for two reasons. Number one, Donetsk and Luhansk are money pits. Um, Russia is not exactly a wealthy country. They don't have, um, it's not good for them if they have to pour money into endeavors that are not profitable. And supporting Donetsk and Luhansk costs a lot of money. It's already cost them a lot of money. And if they were to formally take them in, it would be even more money. Um, the Russian Duma was trying to say that Putin should provide um, stipends for all the refugees that are leaving Luhansk and Donetsk here over the weekend. Uh, that costs money and, and that's not an easy thing for Russia to kind of solve. So I don't think they want the money pit that, that goes with that. Second of all, I think that what, and again, I, I think that Russia wants Ukraine to be neutral at the very least. It wants um, Ukraine to be part of the Russian sphere of influence, but it would also be fine with neutrality. 
Um, so, you know, if, if you could get assurances that Russia wasn't going to join Ukraine, everything would be, uh, excuse me, that Ukraine was not going to join NATO, probably Russia would be okay and they'd be willing to kind of play ball a little bit. Why does that matter? Donetsk and Luhansk are full of Russian speakers who like Russia. So if you take them out of Ukraine, the electorate becomes even more pro-Western. This is part of the reason it doesn't make sense to go after Eastern Ukraine, because if you only conquer the Eastern part of Ukraine that is more Russia friendly, you haven't done anything for Russia's geopolitical imperative. You have to get all the way to Western Ukraine to get to the Carpathian Mountains and make an actual difference. Um, if you take, if you start hiving off portions of Eastern Ukraine, all you're doing is creating a Ukrainian rump state that is even more pro-Western. And by doing the invasion stuff, not only have you engendered sanctions, you're leaving that Western rump state of Ukraine up, maybe actually will join NATO, especially because you know, the, the rest of the West will see that Russia didn't abide by its promises and might feel even more threatened. Um, so all of that makes me say that I don't think that they're going to go after Donetsk and Luhansk that way. I do think the probability is a little bit more than the invasion thing. I, it's more kind of a 50-50 thing. I think some of it also matters what Donetsk and Luhansk can do themselves. Um, that's one of the variables here that's almost impossible to quantify because we might have Russia right and Ukraine right and the US right, but we might not know exactly what the people in Donetsk are doing. And they have geopolitical imperatives as well. They might want to create the sort of thing that would cause Russia to come in because they think that's what's best for them. So I, I would say that Donetsk, Luhansk, just based on what's happened this morning, it's, it's kind of 60-40, 50-50, and it's sort of 80-70 to 20-30 in terms of whether an invasion is going to happen. How does a potential Iran deal uh, help or hurt Putin's leverage? I'll say hi to Neil as well. Um, so th that's actually one of the interesting things that's been happening in all this, because again, so much is getting swept under the rug because of all the, all of the headlines about what's going on. So the main Russian negotiator on the Iran nuclear deal said today he thought they were days away from a deal. Um, so even as we're having all of this um, geopolitical intrigue between the United States and Russia over what's going on in Ukraine, you actually have all the parties to the Iran nuclear deal seeming to finally be making progress. And Russia is one of the ones that is really in Iran's ear and is pushing Iran in that direction. Um, when I said that, I, I think that one of the unfortunate things about, I said it was unfortunate that um, Russia has become a domestic political issue in the United States. One of the reasons I think it's unfortunate is because in the Middle East, Russia and the United States actually have very, very similar interests. Um, Russia doesn't like Islamist terrorism any more than the United States does. Russia does not want to see any country, whether it's Iran or Turkey or the Saudis, dominate the region in general. The United States doesn't either. We're, the United States is looking for a balance of power in the region. Um, so the Middle East is actually one area where if you could get past these Ukraine issues and these Eastern Euro European security issues, the United States and Russia actually have some common interests that they could work on. So I have not seen that the Iran issue is directly linked, um, but I do think it's interesting that we're seeing progress on the Iran issue, even as we get all of this geopolitical intrigue around the Ukraine issue. Great. Um, so we have a few investment related questions that we'll segue into now. So one of the guests says, I'm curious how CI incorporates this analysis into, into its investments other than increasing its stake in Russia. What is your decision-making logic from this high level analysis? And then also, can you comment on your long-term views on Russia from an investment perspective, especially given, given their quickly aging population? So the critical thing that we do at CI and that outsiders find it difficult to wrap their head around if you're not in the investment business, is everything is uh, dependent on perception. There's fundamentals and then there's perception. The fundamentals of an individual business, of a country, of an economy, of a commodity, what's happening literally on the ground. And that's in this case where Jacob comes in. Everything that he showed you, the, the maps, the constraints, what are they likely to do or not do? That's fundamental analysis. But the other side of that is we're out in the marketplace and the key thing that we need to really focus on and what we specialize in is understanding not just what are the fundamentals, but what does everyone else think about the fundamentals? 
And really what we do at CI, whether it's investing in an individual stock, investing in a country, investing in a commodity like coffee or gold or whatever it may be, is about really putting ourselves, uh, it's almost a, 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 a process of empathy, as George Soros once said, that what he really does is empathy. And that's really the key is understanding what is the perception on the other side here. So in the case of Russia, um, Russia has been a pariah in the investment community for a long time. If you look at the Russian index, the valuation that's been accorded to Russian companies is extremely low. And in this case, since November, uh, the Russian index has sold off 30, 40% as we headed into this crisis. And since then it's accelerated as all this has gone on. Now, we look at Russia and we see a lot of the same fundamental things that other people see. The demographics are terrible. The long-term economic growth has been poor. Uh, I think the number was when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed at that time, the Soviet economy was about one third the size of the US economy. And today it's much less because the country has stagnated because they haven't made the types of reforms uh, that they've needed to make None of this is new, this is banal. So why are we investing in Russia? Well, because the perception has gotten so out of whack with that reality. Um, if you look, there's been academic studies done on emerging markets investing that have shown that there's virtually no correlation between the GDP growth of a, company, of a country and the uh, returns from investing in that, country, in that country's equity markets. So think about that for a moment. You could look 10 years in the future and you could figure out which countries are going to grow the fastest. And you would think, wow, all you have to do is invest in those countries and, and you're safe. Well, it's actually quite the opposite. The countries that have outperformed are the ones that are doing very poorly, but where the perception is uh, very, very negative, And then that reverts upwards again. Um, so right now, at CI, we have a number of investments like this. We're invested in Chile. We're invested in, uh, we have a small position in Turkey. Uh, and we have this small position in Russia, for example. And the process is very similar in all three cases where, you know, our analysis shows that people are too pessimistic. And that's a very powerful force when those expectations are reversed. Uh, and it doesn't have to be that everyone becomes super positive about Russia. That's the home run play. But really, you know, we look to invest over a six month to a two year period. And right now, people couldn't be more scared of Russia. Uh, other investors who don't do the kind of in-depth work that Jacob is doing and that we're doing in conjunction with him are scared. And their portfolio managers are saying, hey, what the heck is going on in Russia? There's a war. Why do we have investments here? And one of you know these people who have investments all over the world and haven't done the deep work, they say, okay, well, let's get out of there. And right now, all of the investment committees across the world are saying, my God, get us out of Russia. This is a terrible situation. And decision by committee is necessarily reactive and slow. So uh, all of this is a long-winded way of saying that when we see a big divergence between the perception and the, the fundamentals, and you see a catalyst for that perception to close over time. And in this case, we do. You know, there probably is not going to be a major invasion, as Jacob has laid out. Those are the source of opportunities that we're looking to capture. Um, so it's really about psychology, empathy, understanding who's on the other side of the trade, and where does that match up with our understanding of the fundamentals beneath it. And I think at this time we have no more questions. So Jacob, that was great. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for attending. There will be a replay of this video that we'll distribute to attendees. If you'd like to share it uh, privately with someone who you think would enjoy it, you're free to do so. If you have follow-up questions, you wanna speak with Jacob, you wanna speak with someone at Cognitive about how we invest uh, uh, in cases like this or otherwise, feel free to contact us directly. Jacob's email is jacob at cognitive.investments. 
My email is rob at cognitive.investments. And thank you again. We look forward to the next time.